I invite you to pray with me in uh, preparation for our time in the Word this morning. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we're gathered in this place. We need to hear from you. And we know that your Word is our daily bread. We do not live by physical food alone, but we live by every word that comes from your mouth. And Father, we know that what you have spoken, because you have said it, is living and active. And we need that, Father, right now to penetrate our minds and our hearts. And so, Lord, would you grant us, by your Spirit, this uh, grace to hear from you. Lord, for all of us gathered in this room, to look beyond the mere man, to, to anticipate that we're going to hear your word from you. Father, that's a supernatural thing. So I need your help, God, to get out of the way of this. And I pray that uh, Christ himself will be glorified among us even in this time. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want to just use as a launching point uh, for our message this morning, 1 Peter 1, 1 and 2. It's a greeting. Admittedly, I'm not going to do an exposition of 1 Peter this morning, and this sermon is somewhat topical, uh, but I think it is important. But I will read that from the beginning of 1 Peter. Peter writing says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the, of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, some find uh, it complicated. I'm, I'm, however, comfortable explaining how an internal combustion engine works. Kathy, if I talk about it, she's she just like, I'm talking one ear and goes out the other, blah, blah, blah. You know, it's like, what are you talking about? I marvel at engines. Uh, but when I hear people describe medical things, I get lost. Kathy, on the other hand, takes great interest in these things. And uh, I'll go to the doctor, and Kathy will ask me the details. What do the docs say? Cholesterol, blood pressure, PSA, just a bunch of numbers to me. All I want to know is it good or bad or somewhere in between. Now, this is true with, with study and attention. It is possible to gain a comprehensive understanding of things in the created order. But how do you explain God? How can the finite mind grasp the infinite? And that's, that's what theology attempts to do. But to think that we might gain a comprehensive understanding of God, well, that's, that's not something that we should really expect to do. Yet, we need to think rightly about God. We need to think rightly about how He has revealed Himself. And in, in fact, to think rightly about Him is according to His self Revelation, not according to the things that we might imagine. To do otherwise, other than his self-revelation, would be idolatry, and, and people have slipped into that time and again. Now, I began this series uh, with a desire to, to give attention to God's nature in order that we would worship him as we ought. That's my goal. But also to represent him faithfully to those who do not know him. When we speak about God, how do we speak of him? Now, in weeks past, we've considered that God is holy, and also last week we sp spent time on the fact that God is love. And as I said earlier, I'm admitting here, I'm not doing an exposition even of this verse, but really to use it in First Peter, that is to say, but really to use it as a launching point. This greeting uh, in Peter's letter, he's, he's addressing these believers in Jesus, they're scattered around Asia Minor, and in a single sentence what he does was, is he identifies these exiles, and he calls them elect, invoking God, Father, Holy Spirit, and Jesus Christ the Son. What Peter is doing in this letter, just in this opening, just in this greeting, 
what he is doing, what he is assuming is what I want us to explore today, that God is triune. Now, talk about God being triune. That's the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. And Trinity simply means threefold. That he is one, that God is one, is essential to the doctrine of the Trinity. In the word Trinity, it is assumed, though it is not explicit. And so we could say this, or I will say this. The doctrine of the Trinity is that God is triune. The word triune, maybe you haven't heard that or, or at least applied it to God. And really, as far as I can tell, it's kind of a theological word. It was coined in the early 17th century. The word is Latin in origin. It describes three persons of the Godhead as a unity. Tri, meaning three, of course. You get that. Un, uh, from the Latin uh, unus, meaning one. Now, I'll grant that I think most of us in this room would, would take this doctrine for granted. But that doesn't mean it's easy to explain. People have tried to draw analogies from creation like H2O. You know, you've, maybe you've heard that one. You know, God is like H2O, liquid, gas, and a solid. Or like a three-leaf clover or eggs, shell, yolk, and white. But these analogies, these illustrations fall far short. They could fall into modalism, that there is uh, one God who takes three different forms. That's, that's heretical. Or, or somehow that, that the persons of God are different in essence. Again, also a heretical idea. But what we do have, what we do have when we think about God and his being triune, we have what the scripture reveals. And I certainly don't expect to exhaust the topic. You know, when you look through a theology book and talk, and see the doctrine of the Trinity, there are many, many, many pages. Um, I'm not going to exhaust the topic this morning. But I want us to consider the fact that God is triune, but through a particular experiential lens. Here's what I mean. As Christians, we encounter the triune God through genuine faith in Jesus Christ. Josh uh, loaned me a little book this past week by a guy named Michael Reeves. It helped me. And, and in there I saw uh, describing this, and it never stood out to me before. When Peter was preaching, he was preaching to a Gentile named Cornelius who had, who had, who had inquired because he had received a vision from the Lord and he needed to hear the gospel. And God set it up so that Peter would go, go see this Gentile. But Peter, describing the ministry of Jesus, this is what Peter said, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. Describing the ministry of Jesus, God implying the Father anointed Jesus, the Son, with the Holy Spirit and that God the Father was with the Son. The ministry of Jesus that saves people reveals that it is only through faith in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that we can see Jesus for who he truly is and what he has ultimately accomplished for us. So it's from that perspective, the perspective of having been saved, made part of the family of God, that I wanted to consider this morning that God is triune. So here's my basic thesis statement for, for our time together this morning. First of all, God is one. The Father elects, the Son secures, and the Spirit, Spirit enlivens His people to salvation. Let me say it again. God is one. The Father elects, the Son secures, and the Spirit enlivens His people to salvation. First of all, God is one. Perhaps, well, the older among the crowd will remember a song by Three Dog Night. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever do. And, he also said, two can be as bad as one. It's the loneliest number since the number one. Now, of course, we get that that may be true for someone who's lost the love of their life, as the song is describing. Or worse, one being one, someone who lives their, their entire life in complete isolation from any other human. God absolutely agrees with that. That's a lonely number. In fact, God said at the creation, it is not good for the man to be alone. But that is not true for God. He cannot be lonely because he loses nothing and he lacks 
nothing at all, being the only God. As it says in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. So God is one, yet He is three persons, and that means He is one in essence, one in being. Yet the singularity of God's being is by His own self-revelation, here's what I'm like, a plurality. This is hinted at in the creation narrative. In the beginning of Genesis, the right the beginning of the Bible, the first verse, God, says in the beginning, God, the word in Hebrew, Elohim, created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God, Elohim, that Elohim is plural. And then in verse 2, the Spirit of God, a person of God was acting on creation in a particular way. That the Spirit of God hovered, was distinct, yet not separated from God in creation. Not only was the Spirit present at creation, the Father present at creation, but so was the Son. John's Gospel, we're told that the word spoke spoke the word spoken by god in genesis when the lord said let there be john tells us that that was in fact the son of god the living word of god so that as john says all things were made through him through the word of god and without him was not anything made that was made So we see here, even in creation and the beginning of the Gospel of John, there is a distinction in the persons of God, but perfect unity because the persons of of God are singular in being. Now we try to get our head around that. That's that's a little challenging. When, When the Lord revealed himself to Moses, he told him his name, Yahweh, sometimes anglicized as Jehovah. Yahweh, meaning I am that I am. It's really a form of the, the, the Hebrew verb to be, existence. I am existence. We see this in further down in the creation story, verse 26 of Genesis 1, when God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. We see the plurality of the persons of God in the singularity of the being of God. See, man was created by God after the image of his being. Not images, plural, of his beings, plural, but the image, singular, of his being, singular. In an analogous way, man is a singular being, in the image of God, comprised of body, soul, and spirit. This says that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. With the body, and humanly speaking, we encounter in our bodies the physical realm, right? We touch, we feel, we smell, we taste. We walk. With the soul, we, a psyche, we think, we reason, we desire. And then with the spirit, we connect with the spirit of God. When God made man, he breathed life into him, Genesis 2, 7. And now having been made spiritually alive in Christ by the Holy Spirit, he, God, the Spirit, personally bears witness to our spirit that we belong to him. See that connection. We're a singular being with a plurality of aspects of that being which are effectively inseparable. Now, of course, thinking about this, we have to be careful not to interpret God from human existence, not to think about the human existence and then decide what God is like. Rather, we must understand human existence from the self-revelation of God. As image bearers of the triune God, we are certainly a dim and also a sin-corrupted reflection of His being. Yet, yet in love, God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has determined to rescue His people and restore us to that untarnished image 
and ultimately fellowship, eternal fellowship with Him. God is one. But that story continues, that thesis continues. God is one. The Father who elects to salvation is God. The Father who elects to salvation is God. Now, in a few weeks, most here, I'm, I'm guessing, are going to go to the polls, and what you're going to do is you're going to make a decision to choose who you think at that moment to be the best candidate for state senator. I think governor is up, uh, congressmen, senators for Washington. When, when you choose, you're making a distinction, right? You elect one set of candidates and pass over others for your own reasons, for whatever reason you've determined. Now, at the end of time, there's going to be a ransomed people from, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. There will be a group of people who are ransomed from out of all of the nations, out of the tribes, out of the languages. That's Revelation 5.9. These are people whose names have been written in the book of life. But there will also be a larger group of people, people who God will pass over, those whose names have not been written in the book of life. And as it says in Revelation 20, 15, they will be cast into the lake of fire. That is ominous. But that's what the Bible says. So what's the difference? The difference is those whom the Father has chosen. And I know, I know this is a difficult doctrine for some. Those whom the Father has chosen are the elect. That God elects is his absolute and eternal right to do. He told Moses, as he described what he would do, he told Moses, I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. Moses wasn't asking the question, but it certainly when his, was in his mind. Who gets to be favored? God says, the one I choose. I know that's challenging, but on the other side of it, being a recipient of God's grace is not something that those who are elect can take pride in. Those who are saved are no more worthy in and of themselves than the condemned. God saves. God shows mercy. He pours out grace because he chose. And that's hidden from us as to why. So if you are among the elect, gratitude, heartfelt thanks should be the only response. We read this from Ephesians 1 together. This is part of it. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Before man was created, before trees and plants and animals, before the earth, before the stars and the sun and the solar systems, before there was anything, God the Father chose. And if you are in Christ today, If you are in Christ today, what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of choosing? As we think about why did God choose me? We chose you, he chose me, so that we would turn away from our sin, so that we would leave behind our rebellion. He chose you today so that you would ultimately reflect his character, that his image in you would again reflect his glory back to him as a as a clear mirror god chose you to be holy and blameless therefore you must elect you must decide you must choose to do 
just that. Be holy and blameless. God the Father elects to salvation, but our salvation isn't only accomplished with the Father choosing, electing. And that brings us to the second heading, or third heading, I should say. God is one, the Father elects, who is God elects to salvation. Third, the Son who secures salvation is God. The Son who secures salvation is God. Now, you live in a house or an apartment. When you decided to live in the house or apartment that you now occupy, of course, you had to choose it. Maybe some have recently moved to the area and you drove around the neighborhood and said, well, there's one for sale. Maybe we'll take that one. But choosing it isn't enough, right? There has to be something else, even if it's empty, right? The owner, the, the landlord needed something from you, right? Payment. Got to pay for it. You had to secure that decision with very real money. Now think about it. What if you didn't have any money at all? All your choosing would be absolutely in vain. I choose that house. You got no money. Sorry. Can't live in it. Well, you get the point. You can't have what you can't pay for. Now, while the Father elected some to salvation, that salvation came at a great cost. You and I cannot pay. We, we don't have anything in our moral bank account to draw on to make us worthy. We were born in sin, as it says in Psalm 51. We are among those, it says in Romans 3.10, describes who are, well, we are this. This is us. None is righteous. No, not one. Excludes no one. None is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. That's, that's our default, right? And since Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, my default position and your default position is being condemned. I want salvation, and I know you do too, but I can't pay. You can't pay. But who, who is flawless? Who, who is pure in every sense? Who lived before the Father and obeyed everything in the law of God? You know, of course, the Son of God he took on a human body, and he did just that. He paid. He paid in his humanity but he was no less God. Now, the Gospel of John, we've touched on this a little bit. The Gospel of John tells us about Jesus' divinity. He is the Word of God, who was God and who was in the beginning with God. He was the Word who became flesh and dwelt among us. And then a few chapters later, John 3, 31, it says there, he who comes from above, referring to Jesus, is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth, and speaks in an earthly way, but he who comes from heaven is above all. See, the one who is above all can only be God. Yet, yet he is man. The God-man. The one and only Son of God stood in your stead and mine, and he secured full payment. Full payment for that sin, that debt, that ugliness that we carry with us. He secured that payment by dying in our place. And if you have looked to him in faith, he has willingly taken the full record of your sin upon himself. Jesus was unjustly accused. He was hideously tortured. He was cruelly nailed to a Roman cross. He was mercilessly mocked. And he died on full display and was buried in a tomb. That death was vicarious, was in your place. In himself, he was absolutely flawless. But the sin of those that the Father has chosen was credited, imputed to Jesus, the Son of God, as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21. I think Jim touched on this in Sunday school this morning. For our sake, it says there, for our sake, he, the Father, made him the Son. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So again, uh, for our sake, that is the elect, 
The Father imputed our sin to the one who knew no sin, the Son. Not only that, but he also did that so that the very righteousness of the Son might be imputed, credited back to us. That is a glorious truth. Now, if the Son of God were guilty of sin, in any way at all, the slightest, death would have absolutely swallowed him up for eternity. <laughs> of course, that was impossible. As the Son of God. Because that sin was not his own, he rose again. And this is what we celebrate at Resurrection Sunday. But really, every time we come together, we're acknowledging that Jesus, the Son of God, who is buried in a tomb, is alive and seated at the right hand of the Father. It's a glorious truth. But he rose again from that grave and he conquered sin. He conquered all of our sin. And because he rose from death, that life that he lives is given to all who believe. That life is forever. Now I know, and I've, I've heard this before, some wonder, I, what if I'm not elect? What if I'm not elect? Well, it's not something to worry about. And I'll tell you why. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, so you open the Bible and you see, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. If you believe that to be true, if you believe that He died in your place, end of the Gospel. Yeah, He was put in a tomb and He did that for me. If you believe that He died in your place, if as a result of that, you also believe that He rose again from the grave, and if it is your desire, having believed that, that you would live a holy and blameless life. That's what you want. And you're grateful for this indescribable gift? If that's you, you're elect. But how does that happen? How does that apply to one person and not another? Why does one person think that it's a silly story? And you know people who think that. That it's silly and absurd that a, a man named Jesus would, would die. Okay, that's fine. But that he actually came out of the tomb and the third day, go away. Why is it that one believes and cherishes that story and, and lives by it and then the other thinks it's absurd? The answer? Life. Life. Life is the answer. That's the reason why. So how did you get it? And that's my last point. The Spirit who enlivens for salvation is God. Children are born every single day throughout the world. There's some newborns here among us, and some are expecting soon. It's glorious. And you know this, mothers, you carry those babies and you marvel, even as they're growing inside you. They, you marvel at the heartbeat, the, the churning and moving in your womb. You get that? And while dads may only experience that second hand, put your hand here. He, she's moving. Dads who hold those little ones for the first time, they're, no matter how tough they are, they're often moved to tears, the wonder of it all, right? Oh yeah, you, you get the biology of it, you understand the birds and the bees, but still a miracle. It's not just skin and cells and bone and blood. He moves, she squirms, breathes, feeds, and fills the diaper. <laughs> but it's glorious. It's life. And it's glorious because it's supernatural. We we participate it. God allows us to have this participation, but how it happens? Something beyond the material. And what did that little baby do to arrive at her mother's breast? Nothing at all. That baby had no choice in the matter at all. Now we think, what accounts for someone to become a child of God. How does that person turn and see that Jesus is the Son of God crucified for him and raised to life? How does that happen? That's supernatural. And we've said this. God 
elects to salvation. And if you have believed, he, it is because he wrote your name in his book before creation. And Jesus died and rose again to secure your salvation. But, but how was it applied to you? How was that act of grace made effectual so that you believed? Was it because you were clever enough to comprehend it all or that you just wanted it badly enough? Was it because you had the right parents or family tree? Well, Jesus explained it this way to a, a religious leader who needed to be instructed. This is Nicodemus. Perhaps you're familiar with this in John 3. Jesus said to him, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He used that word born. Born. That which is born of flesh is flesh, like the baby born in your family. That's flesh. But that which is born of spirit is spirit. Born of the spirit, that's the Holy Spirit. As the spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters at creation, at some point in your life, he hovered over your spirit and he breathed spiritual life into you. And when your spiritual eyes were opened, at that moment you felt the weight of your sin. You knew that you were powerless to make good the eternal debt that you've amassed before a holy God. And then that moment you saw Jesus for who he is, the Son of God crucified in your place. You believed because you were made alive. It's not the other way around. You weren't made alive because you believed. The question is often beget asked, what can a dead man do? We could say very little, but it's actually nothing at all. No, you believe because you were made alive. The Holy Spirit made you alive in Christ. First, uh, sorry, 2 Corinthians 5.17 just before that other verse I quoted, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So the old, that's the, 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 the sin, the rebellion, the independent spirit that we say, God, I don't want your involvement in my life. That's the spiritual death. That's the, the evidence of being spiritually dead is, is loving sin, hating God, and wanting to do our own thing. But, but Paul says, that is gone. It's passed away. It's because the Holy Spirit has placed you into Christ alive, spiritually alive. Now, having secured your salvation, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, having applied this, you now belong to God. And the working of the Spirit it doesn't end there. Having Having, uh, sorry, having given you life, awakening you to who Jesus is, he now indwells you to sustain your spiritual life. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians, your body, the physical human body, it's a temple, a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God. And he adds this, you are not your own. So as a new creation in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit within you to make it possible for you to become what God intended for you when he chose you before the foundation of the world. The Spirit within makes it possible to be holy and blameless in his sight. No, I get it. We're not arriving all at once. We're not perfected, but it's a process, and you know, believers in Jesus, you know how this works. You encounter the Word of God, and you see it says, do not covet. You shall not have a hateful thought. You shall not be filled with lust. And you feel the conviction. And immediately you recognize, I don't measure up. And the spirit within moves your spirit to say, God, I need your grace to leave that behind. And slowly and steadily over time, you don't become sinless, but you sin less. So the Holy Spirit within you not only reminds you that you're a child of God, that's Romans 8, 16, but he empowers you to increasingly 
over time, reflect the image of God intended for you. And everything that you need to live in a way that pleases God, you have access to. And what the Holy Spirit does is He directs you. He directs you to the scriptures that remind you of the promises of God in the gospel of Christ. This is what Peter said in his second letter. Chapter 1, 3 and 4. I love this. I often go here. His divine power has granted to us all things. Nothing's excluded. All things that pertain to life and godliness. Now, pause there. His divine power Everything you need to live and live a godly life that's been granted to you. How? Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. Who's that? Son of God. By which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises. And what do those promises do? So that through them you may become partakers of the, get this, divine nature you become a partaker of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire you know what that's like that sinful desire but you're becoming a partaker in the divine nature that's that's glorious that's the spirit of god reminding us of the word of god so that we become like god in some sense, so that his image in us that was tarnished when the first man and woman in the garden disobeyed the command of God not to eat from the fruit of the tree of good and evil, plunging themselves and all of their offspring after them into darkness and separation from God. The image of God, though present, was tarnished. But now in the Father's election and the Spirit, spirits and sort of the sun securing and the spirit applying it you now have access to everything power for life and godliness and you become a partaker in that divine nature that's god's goodness his mercy his grace his justice his holiness his love unending for your eternal joy in him well so what what do we do with all this? It's theological, but I hope in some sense it's practical too. We worship and serve one God in three persons of a singular being and es essence who for his own purposes and glory created you and me and has called us to eternal life in himself for his own purposes because he chose to be merciful because he chose to pour out his grace he has secured that salvation the father has secured that salvation in the death and resurrection of Jesus the son and he has applied it to you through the spiritual birth and the continual indwelling of the Holy Spirit you and I, brothers and sisters, we encounter the triune God through the God-man, Jesus. Apart from him, we would not. And trusting in him is truly knowing God. So when he speaks, the Holy Spirit creates and sustains life in us. John says in John's gospel says, For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. Jesus, the Son of God, he whom God has sent, utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son. You see the Trinitarian aspect of this. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, and whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So in light of this truth, how, how then shall we live? as those who have been saved into and for fellowship with the triune God, we are now to order our lives around the imperative to invite others to know God through faith in Christ. We order our lives around the mission that Jesus gave, make disciples. 
Matthew 9, uh, 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, immersing them, washing them, symbolically identifying with Christ in his death and resurrection, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. We, we make disciples in the name of, that is to say, by the order of, according to the will and purpose of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And as we live our lives, we do so seeking to obey all that God has commanded to us and leading others to obey everything that Jesus taught, every word that has come from the mouth of God. Now that God is triune, in some sense, to our, to our finite minds, it remains a mystery. As I said earlier, the the finite cannot fully grasp the infinite, and that requires faith. But having heard the word of God, believe and so live. And in the meantime, hold fast in faith and hope for the day when Jesus returns. And what we hold to by faith in terms of who God is, how he's revealed himself. We will grasp by sight to his glory and our joy forever. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you because Jesus said to pray to you. And we know that because he secured the place that you established in your book before the foundation of the earth, and because your spirit has applied to us the very word of truth and the gospel, we are called your children. God, would you help us to worship you rightly, to speak of you to others rightly, And while we cannot fully grasp the infinite, God, strengthen our faith so that we hold fast to the hope of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and that day when we see, when we know, as we have been known. Be glorified in your people individually and in our church. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.